Okay, I think we hit the starter mark. So hi, everybody. Uh, I am Julie Rhodes. Um, thank you for joining me again today. Um, I presented yesterday morning. Luckily enough, Andrew lets me take a lot of his time. <laughs> thank goodness. Um, but thanks for joining me uh, for the CVP Fall Virtual Conference in 2022. Um, thank you to all of our sponsors for keeping this free. Thank you. We appreciate you so, so, so much. Um, I'm going to kind of switch directions a little bit today. We are going to be talking about how to manage your team uh, with a scorecard system. And I will explain exactly what that is in the upcoming slides and discussions. But um, I want to encourage everybody, like if you're if you're watching this, um, you know, it's great that you're here watching. But if you have questions, um, please use the chat, uh, whether you're in Facebook or YouTube, to ask questions. Um, Andrew's going to help me out, kind of manage those as best as I can. I'll be going back and forth between my presentation um, and the StreamYard feed so that I can see what's going on with you guys out there. But um, welcome again. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Julie Rhodes. Again, uh, I'm the owner operator of Not Your Hobby Marketing Solutions. Uh, I am a strategic business consultant, um, and I specialize in the lanes of retail sales strategies, um, digital marketing plans, and also distribution management. And that's how I help people out um, with their beverage businesses. I mainly work with breweries, but I have a few cider, cider clients as well. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, oop, did I go a little too far? Um, slide disappeared on me there, but usually I have this funny slide with a whole bunch of stuff about me and it says like a little bit about me, but I will summarize it in just a little bit. So I've been in uh, the beverage industry for over two decades, um, lots of time in the service industry and almost 12 years on the supplier side of um, sales um, in the beer industry, uh, management, regional management, um, national accounts, chain buying, things like that. Um, I covered a whole bunch of different states. So I've sold beer in a lot of different places. Um, and I cut my teeth in the industry in the import segment, um, which is, you know, some people say, well, it wasn't really craft focused. Yes, I realize that. But try to sell import beer in a craft dominated world is pretty challenging. So I learned some good lessons along the way. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I have been running my own consultancy for over three years now. Um, I am the Denver chapter leader for Pink Boots Society. I sit on the DEI marketing and communication subcommittee for the Brewers Association. I'm also one of the founding members of the Safe Bars Pact Initiative. If you don't know what that is, please check it out um, so that we can get more people Safe Bar certified um, to create a more inclusive and equitable industry across the board. Uh, I hail from Colorado right now. I'm actually on location with one of my clients in uh, North Charleston, South Carolina, with the lovely people at Common House Ale Works. Please come see them. Um, but I live right outside of Denver with my husband, my two boys, a whole bunch of dogs, a leopard gecko, a cat, all kinds of people. So um, I am also, uh, I consider myself a connoisseur of donuts. I love coffee. Um, I played uh, league pool for about six years. Um, so try not to play pool with me too often. Um, and I'm also a pretty big sci-fi nerd. So I'm not just business all the time to give you a little bit of insight about me. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, this is kind of the agenda of what we're going to go over today. Uh, basically, we're going to go over what a scorecard actually is. Um, I'm going to explain what that is, but uh, who is it for also as well? Um, what does it look like? I'm going to talk about the prep work involved that you'll have to do to get your own set up. Um, then we're going to talk about actually setting one up for yourself. Um, just so you know, I'm not cruising Facebook over here on the side. I have my notes out to the side, so just forgive me if I'm looking over. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to actually use your scorecard in action, like in real life. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about analyzing the scorecard as well. All right, so let's get right into it. So what the hell is a scorecard system and why do you need one? Basically, a scorecard is a form of an in organized infrastructure. So um, this idea that I had uh, for kind of transforming this concept um, for breweries and cider houses, um, this system I came up with myself, but it was taking a lot of influence from a book called Traction. I don't know if anybody 
has read that book. Hopefully you have. It is an absolutely phenomenal business book. Um, it is written by a guy named Gino Wickman. Um, as everybody runs to Amazon and starts like Googling things right now. <laughs> And so it's a it's a wonderful business book. It's about how to kind of better manage your entire organization. Um, he talks about a very structured system called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operation System, Operational System, I believe it is. Super simple words, but for a big concept. Um, and the thing is, is that a scorecard system allows you to um, organize your infrastructure so that every department is kind of like a bucket. And you have different metrics for each one of those departments. And it's a mixture of like benchmarks that you can use, not only to measure the success of that department, but also the effort that people are putting into the business, which I know sounds kind of silly, but I, everybody here probably, I don't know, unless you're a brand new business, um, went through 2020 and the shutdowns and things like that. And I know that a lot of people... Um, you might not have been selling the same amount of volume or making the same amount of revenue, but that doesn't mean that people weren't working. So what this system does is basically say, okay, well, we're going to recognize the effort and the work that you're putting into things in like incremental me metrics, instead of just saying, okay, all we're going to look at is results and that's all that we care about. And that's what we're going to judge our goals off of. So this is a really nice way to strategically run your beverage business. Um, it's also a way that you can strategically align your departments. I know that that is kind of a common problem amongst um, beverage businesses is that like one department's not talking to the other, the other one is not talking to the other one and things are kind of misaligned. We try to use things like Slack and, you know, Google chat and text messaging and things like that. But this is really a way to kind of lay out the whole system so that everybody knows what the other person is working on, what they're working towards, and people can kind of talk to each other a little bit more. Um, it's also data that can fuel your revenue streams, which I don't think anybody here would be opposed to, honestly. <laughs> and that means that you are tracking metrics that not only track activities and results, but those things are based off of smaller pieces of your overall business goals. So those business goals are designed and set up to drive your revenue streams. So you literally have people working on like tiny little bits and pieces, like incremental activities and small wins that will put money in your back pocket, which is a really great thing to have. Um, the other thing that it provides you with is really clear performance-based metrics um, instead of just things like, oh, I'm just going to get an hourly wage for this person or, oh, it's an annual based salary plus like a percentage commission for salespeople or maybe for front of the house or like a tap room manager or something. Maybe it's like a percentage of revenue or, you know, whatever it might be. Right. Um, it provides a way for you to actually compensate your team. Um, for the effort they are putting into it, also for the results that they're producing. But you also get credit for things like if salespeople's uh, people are making enough account visits of what you've kind of agreed on, um, you know, if sampling opportunities are taken care of, if they're building displays, you know, the marketing folks, if they're like sending out marketing emails, if they're growing the number of your social media follower base, things like that. So elements like that that you can use to kind of track the success of your business um, by activities and results. Um, it's also a way to think about things in a forward thinking way instead of a historical way all the time. So um, for those that are already uh, like you have goals, business goals organized, and you might have goals for each one of your departments, um, when you track your progress towards those goals, whether it's like monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it is, those numbers are already in the past. You can't do anything about those numbers at all. They're done. They're already done for. You can only look at moving forward. But with a scorecard system, yes, you should be tracking those historical numbers and those goals. But at the same time, this gives you a way to kind of track things by week or by month in real time like forward facing so that you can see like, oh, hey, wait a second, like I'm off pace a little bit. I need to like kick it into high gear for the rest of the month. That way you don't fall behind. Like you have a chance to sort of have a crystal ball and look forward and to say like, okay, I can be proactive about 
X, Y, Z, and I need to do this before the end of the month so that I don't fall behind. And then you get to quarter four and you're like, oh shit, what can I do? A scorecard gives you a way to kind of look into the future as best as you can um, and react accordingly. Um, the other thing is, is that the scorecard, the elements, we're going to go through those later on. I'm going to show you an example of one. And then um, when I give everybody a copy of the slides, I'm also going to give everyone a template, like a sample one that I just like made up. It's a bunch of generic information um, so that you have a tool to use um, so that you can create your own. Uh, these scorecard elements, whereas like your overall business goals, you probably have like two to four overall business goals, maybe departmental goals, like let's just say the marketing department. Hopefully you have like a strategic marketing plan. Maybe you have two to four strategic marketing goals that are annual for the whole year. This is going to take inspiration from those goals, but your scorecard elements are a list of like five to 10 sort of kind of KPIs, so to speak. If you want to, I don't know, I kind of stray away from using that buzzword because they aren't really, um, technically they are because they're indicators, they're performance indicators, but um, I don't really use that in this term. I just kind of refer to it as scorecard metrics. But there are five to 10 metrics that are smaller versions of your overall annual goals that kind of read the pulse of the business. So if it doesn't measure something that is getting you closer to achieving your goals, then it's not a pulse point, right? And probably shouldn't be included on your scorecard. We'll go into that more in just a second. This is another thing. This is a big advantage with a scorecard system is that it helps to remove bias from your business operations. So it standardizes employee narratives. Um, and I hope the human resources people out there uh, agree with me on this. Hopefully they do. I'm not an HR expert, by the way. That's why I do not consult for HR policies. <laughs> That's hardcore stuff out there. Um, but what it does is it puts very clear expectations of everybody's role in place so that there's no question about what you should be doing. And if you go so far as to go beyond just using a scorecard for um, performance tracking and you tie it to a compensation system or a bonus system or an incentive, like a reward, something like that, or even uh, like a promotional ladder, right? So like if you do this, then you get promoted to this or if this, then that, right? It sets things up very clearly from the beginning so that there's no personal bias in there, right? It says like when you reach this point, you will achieve this thing or you will be promoted to this position. So you can actually leverage this tool to help you take some of that like favoritism, some of that bias like out of the whole equation when we're dealing with managing humans, right? The last thing is, if it wasn't clear before, this gives you clarity, right? So it gives your team members concrete numbers to focus on in the short term so they don't get overwhelmed by like big, super uh, gigantic, like scary annual goals, right? Um, I'm a big fan of taking big goals and having just a few to focus on, but then breaking it down into smaller pieces so it doesn't seem that, I don't know, that challenging, like it doesn't seem insurmountable, like you're being set up to fail. Um, are human brains like smaller pieces of things to deal with um, as we go along? So it gives people some smaller numbers to focus on as like smaller incremental wins, which helps keep up the motivation of your team which is a nice thing to have at this point. Um, I know a lot of us struggle with keeping your team motivated or, you know, um, keeping up morale, basically. Um, and then also, honestly, it eliminates decision fatigue. <laughs> so trying to figure out um, what to rank people on, what to talk about at weekly meetings, what to talk about during employee reviews, quarterly reviews, annual reviews, you go to your scorecard, you reference your scorecard. Um, if you need to like hire for a new position and you're wondering how to do like the job description or lay out the roles and responsibilities, you can use your scorecard for inspiration. So it can provide a whole lot of clarity for your business and how you run things. All right. So let's talk about the different departments that we can use a scorecard for and then the elements of what you might see on a scorecard for each one of these departments. Now, I have at the bottom five to 15 elements for each department. I would say if this is something that you want to do, um, start with baby steps first. 
maybe just do like five elements. If you've been using a version of this already, but you just need to tweak it a little bit, maybe go for 10 elements. I would say for the people that feel like very well advanced or like very confident about, um, you know, executing this kind of strategy, uh, I would say go for 15, like who knows? Or maybe you have a really large uh, employee base, right? You have a lot of people. So there might be some that are spread out to just specific people that are with that department. So just judge it based on um, the size and the maturity of your own brand organization. Um, the first department that I always like to apply this to is sales, first of all, because it's personal and I've done it before, not only as myself in sales, but also with clients that I work with and also with my group coaching program that I run. Um, I have seen this executed in real time I really like the way that the results come out. I think it makes it very clear on how to manage your team. I also really like using a scorecard for a compensation model with um, sales representatives or sales teams, because I feel like there's a lot of like concrete sales metrics that you can use um, to measure somebody's performance overall as like a sales representative, sales manager, national accounts manager, whatever they might do, it might be doing key accounts, so on and so forth. Um, so the kind of metrics that you might include in your sales team scorecard would be things like um, number of account visits, um, number of promotions that were executed in a certain time period, um, the number of PODs in a certain time period. So uh, for those that don't know, that's points of distribution or what your distribution footprint looks like. Like that could be expressed as number of pods in the market, number of did buys like retail accounts. It could be expressed as percent market share, the size of a footprint, any of those things that relate to distribution, if that's what you're trying to grow. It could be represented by the number of displays that they've built in the retail marketplace. Um, it could be the number of retailer uh, marketing emails, like B2B marketing emails that have been sent out on behalf of like wholesale sales, um, not to consumer, but to retail buyers. Um, it could be the number of staff trainings um, that your rep representative uh, has done. It could be the number of distributor, um, whatever you want to call them, ride along days, work with days, in market days. It varies throughout different distributors, but whatever that might be. But those are really good measures of how you could um, track the performance in like terms of results and activities for your sales team. Uh, next, let's look at marketing. I know mar people are like, Julie, marketing is a gray area. It's really hard to track. It's not that hard to track. If you have, we're going to talk about tools later on. So I'm going to tell you how to do this. Um, it's actually really great to use a scorecard with your marketing team because it makes tracking marketing metrics that much easier because you get used to it. Um, so you can kind of use this as analytic uh, measures as well. Um, so it could be like a certain number of marketing emails, like B to C, like direct to consumer um, marketing emails that are sent out um, like per month, per quarter, whatever your measure is for the time period. Um, it could be uh, the no Ooh, there's a fly in here bothering me. Um, it could be the number of social media posts. Um, you could break that out by channel. You could do the total all together. Um, there's a lot of metrics that you could use with social media, just depending on what your focus is for your brand. It could be follower growth rate, it could be engagement rate, it could be impressions, it could be reach, um, it could be video posts, like maybe you're trying to do more video content. Um, it could be making a uh, content calendar every month and having something go out seven days a week. There's a million things you could do for social media. Um, it could be the performance of your online advertising, like, you know, CPC, like Google ads, like how many clicks did we get? Same thing with like social media ads. What's our click through rate? What's our frequency rate? What's our reach? Which are what's our CPC like cost per click? There's a whole bunch of things that you can do. Um, it could be number of email opens. It could be your click through rate for emails. Um, it could be revenue of merch um, or alcohol if you're in e-commerce and you can do that for um, the folks that are selling like NA beer and also cider as well. If you're doing DTC and e-commerce, if you have a web store, you can create a whole bunch of metrics out of that. Um, it could just be an increase in website traffic, online visitors, or the length of time that people hang out on your homepage. Um, it could be revenue from special events. Now, marketing is a little bit more clear, right? <laughs> it helps with that as well.
Um, you can use this for your production team. So uh, disclaimer here, I am not a production person. I'm a business lady. Um, I am married to a brewer turned packager turned uh, fabricator turned manager. So um, I know like have these on the production side. So just give me some space and grace when it comes to talking about metrics for this. But I'm sure that your production team can work with your managers to try to figure out good metrics for this. But the ones that I could think of that I just threw out there randomly, randomly were things like hitting barrelage goal um, numbers, um, controlling like spillage or spoilage. If you've had to dump any batches, hopefully that's not the case. Um, making sure that release information is released to the right admin people that order the labels and all that kind of stuff, um, keeping an eye on cooperage, uh, keeping up with yeast counts, uh, DO levels, uh, records of CIP being done and being done on time, uh, keeping batch costs down, entering things into your ERP system, things like that. So yeah, again, production folks, forgive me. Those were the ones that I could think of off the top of my head. I hope that that was um, somewhat okay <laughs> for all of you production folks out there. Um, front of the house. This is also a really great one. This could be anything from, did you get the customer's email? Did you sell them merchandise? Did you sell them beer to go? Um, like what those sales look like for each server, right? Like on a monthly basis, things like opening duties that are done, closing duties that are done. Did the menus get wiped down? Did the tables get reset? Um, did you help the taproom manager like reprint new menus? You know, did you have like a standout like customer card or came in for that month? Um, the other thing, oh, did you do anything for continuing education? Um, I know that uh, educating your staff in the taproom for front of the house is a big concern for a lot of people. Maybe, you know, there's some kind of bonus involved for doing that kind of on your own time. Um, not that I want them to pay, you know, for them to like pay that themselves or pay for it themselves. But if they're taking their initiative to educate themselves, maybe with Cicerone or something similar, um, you know, is there a way to tie kind of like a bonus or a reward to that? Um, finally, you can do this with your finance and admin departments as well. And again, I'm not a finance gal and I'm not an admin person and I'm not an HR department, but there are many other departments within your organization, depending on how big it is, um, that you can kind of, I think everybody gets the gist of this. Um, you know, finance admin, it might have to do with accounts payable, accounts receivable, um, payroll done in time, reduction of COGS, um, HR related like certifications and um, training sessions for your teams, um, company communications sent on time, meetings done on time, all that kind of stuff. So feel free to kind of run with it as, you know, as you see fit. So just so you have an example, um, again, this is like a made up one that I just made up for a sales rep on the fly. I actually have another picture of this um, here in just a second. Um, but it basically explains how you can track um, the progress and success of a sales rep based on these different measurables. So you can call them metrics, you can call it measurables, whatever you want to do. Um, I've got a monthly revenue goal, right? Like who would be the sales rep? Obviously, you put somebody's name in there and don't just put sales rep. You've got a second column for your measurables or your metrics. You've got a third column for what you're trying to work towards, um, which is based off of what your time periods are. In this example, I have it set up by month. It could be by week. It could be by quarter. Again, start small. Start with baby steps so that you can kind of, you know, this is going to be a brand new habit as far as management goes and, you know, uh, company organization. Know that change does not happen overnight. Um, it is very hard to implement organizational change. Um, so please know, like, don't expect people to get this totally overnight. It's not a quick change. Um, it is going to take investment in time and effort, not only from ownership and managers, but from the top down, you have to be totally invested in this and make sure that you understand it and make sure that you communicate it properly so that nobody misunderstands what's going on here, right? Um, I've got monthly revenue goal as a measurable, and then I've got the goal every month to be 80% of the goal or higher. Like that's what we're trying to achieve, right? Um, I've got a POD monthly goal at like somewhere off on a side page, by the way, there's a goal number that they're working towards, and then they have to get to 80% or higher of that. 
Um, monthly account visits, 160 per month. That's like a kind of a good like benchmark average for um, a sales rep that is getting out there. It's like 40 account visits a week. It's not that much. Um, but you would, this is what the base of the scorecard would look like. Um, I mentioned tying this to a compensation system. So if that is the case and you want to go into that as the way to actually pay them, you would have some separate columns in here as well for payment details. So like the monthly revenue goal, if they get to 80% or the higher, is it just one flat amount or is it a variable amount, right? Like the PODs, you know, is it a flat amount if you get to that goal, like for that quarter or that month, or is it a variable amount? And the reason I mention this is because here's the thing, when somebody's working harder for you, you're making more money. So if they're doing good for the company, they're doing good for you, and that should be compensated in some way, shape, or form. So there should be an outline of what that looks like. Um, you will have to have additional systems in place to do this. Please know that. It can be done with a spreadsheet. I mean, honestly, it's going to take a little bit of elbow grease, but honestly, it can be done with as simple as a free Google sheet. Um, that's what I did this on. And you know, you you do have to have some software tools in place to like track some of this stuff, but it can be done. I've done it with organizations of various sizes with a lot of tools versus like zero tools, like something as little as a Google Sheet and QuickBooks, honestly. So, all right. So let's talk about the prep work that you are going to have to do because you're going to have to do some homework before you get this up and running. Okay. Um, first of all, goals. You got to know where you want to go before you institute a system of how to get there. So if you have no idea what business goals you have for your organization, there is no way that you can implement a scorecard system. Absolutely not. Um, so take some time, sit down, do the busy work, do the homework, figure out. This is the perfect time to do it, by the way. It's October. It's quarter four. Think about what your plan looks like of where you want to go in 2023. Um, by the way, for anybody that's listening, just, I, I try to keep up with economic, I am not an economist, by the way. Um, I leave that to other people, but I do try to keep with, uh, keep up with economic news and, um, a wonderful person in my group coaching program tipped me off to this article from Morningstar. Um, they track the markets and whatnot, and supposedly inflation is going to go down not that, please, I'm not betting my company on that or anything, but supposedly inflation is going to go down in 2023 and also in 2024. Now, we do go through economic cycles, so it's not going to last forever like that, but I don't know. Maybe that'll put some sunshine in your pants today. Like, that'll put some skip in your step. <laughs> like, brighter days are ahead for our industry, so... Um, anyways, please look forward to 2023 and make some annual business goals. Don't make too many because you don't want to water it down. Um, if you're just getting started with stuff like this and strategic planning, just make two goals for next year. Maybe it's a revenue goal and a barrage goal. And then you just break it down into smaller pieces. Um, it does not have to be complicated or fancy. Um, just make a plan and do it and make some goals. Um, I like to use smart goals. It's old fashioned, but it works. It's not broken. Um, I actually add an extra A in there. So it's S-M-A-R-T, which is um, specific, measurable, attainable. I add an extra A for ambitious because if you're not playing big right now in our space, you're going to get eaten alive. Um, relevant to your company and also time bound or you have like some kind of time frame, like a deadline to do it by. Um, and then each department gets their own like smart goals. And then you go one step further and you do those five, 10, 15 elements that contribute to those big goals overall, right? Okay, the next thing you're gonna have to have is, is an org chart. Hopefully you have this already. This is not, by the way, meant to be like a pecking order or anything like that, but it's a clear like it's a clear picture visually of how everybody is aligned with each other and how the different departments are functioning and like who people, who people can talk to about different things within the organization. And the way that I like to do my org chart actually has like additional lines under each person's name and their role so that everybody knows what everybody else is responsible for. Um, so if I'm, you know, if I'm a marketing person and I'm like, Oh, we have this new beer coming out. 
I need to order labels. Who the hell should I talk to or what's going on? It kind of create, it's not the end all be all of communication systems, but at least it'll give you a layout of like who I should maybe talk to because you can see everybody's roles and responsibilities. Um, and in that, uh, you can also see who should be tracking what. So you should have one person from each department that is tracking everybody's scorecards within those departments. Just have one centralized person. You don't need too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, because it gets very confusing. Um, the other thing is, is that part of that org chart is you do have to get clearly defined roles and responsibilities in order to assign that person activities and results that actually relate to their position. So again, I'm going to turn to um, traction as a source of inspiration. And I absolutely love the way that he does this. He's got this little acronym called GWC. So when it comes to employees, um, you ask yourself, do they get their job? Do they want to do their job? And can they do their job? Do they have the capabilities, right? And it's really not as simple as it sounds. Like, do they get their job in that? Do they know all their responsibilities and all of their roles and what they're responsible for, like on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, and on an annual basis, right? What does done look like? Because done might look differently for owners than it does for people actually in the business, like working on things. So make sure that's really clear and make sure that you communicate that because you don't want people creating their own narratives. Um, that are misaligned in some way. That creates conflict. That's a whole nother talk. Andrew, maybe we'll do that for Panel Fest. I don't know. Um, the other piece of this is, is do they want to do their job, right? So you want to foster an environment where people feel comfortable saying like, I get what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know if I want to do that. Or it could go in reverse. Like, I want to do this, but I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. So these are like weird, awkward conversations that you need to be having with people and you need to foster an environment where like, it's okay to have awkward conversations, but like we need to get things out on the table and be professionals about it so that we can run the business successfully together. Um, the last piece of this is, do they have the capabilities to do it? So like we've set out the responsibilities. We told them what done looks like. Do they want to do the things that are involved with that? And do they feel like they have the tools that they need to actually execute it? And that could be people tools. It could be skills. It could be education. It could be materials. It could be software. Like there's so many different things. So that's something that should be addressed before you put somebody on a scorecard system so that they feel like they have the toolbox to actually get stuff done. Um, finally, if you're going to attach a pay structure for it, you know, I went into that a little, I kind of jumped ahead of myself there and that I went into the pay structure issue um, uh, or the pay structure topic, like when I showed you that example, um, that was just for a sales rep, but I'm sure hopefully people can connect the dots because I don't want to run. I want to watch my time here and be conscious of everybody's time. Um, you know, making sure that you apply a pay structure, like performance-based pay or like PFP elements for people that like acronyms. Um, based off of things that are part of their roles and responsibilities um, so that it actually contributes to the business. So like their activities, they would get rewarded for things that contribute to the business so that it's like an ecosystem instead of a hierarchy, basically. <laughs> That's what we're trying to get to here. If you can tell that I'm a fan of open book management, you can already tell that for all the finance people out there. Yes, I love open book management. I'm not, again, I'm not a finance expert, so I can't really go into that, but I love the concept of it. And uh, I totally support it with all this work um, that I'm doing. It's just, this is my way of doing it from the like sales and management and leadership side of things. <laughs> so finally, you want to uh, map out tracking responsibilities. Again, you want to have kind of a central point person for each department. Um, that is doing the tracking of all the scorecard elements. Um, this means that you're going to need tracking tools, right? That's a good segue for the next piece here. Um, I'm going to list off a little laundry list for you, like a little punch list of things um, that I would like to see in your toolbox if they apply to the elements of your scorecard. So first of all, Google Forms, any like the little purple icon, right? Google Forms, those are really, really great for people to use in their positions on gathering metrics for you to track, right? Super easy to use. You can feed those into a Google Sheet. They're really awesome. 
Um, pretty much anything from the Google universe is great because it's free. So Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides. Yeah, slides, forms, all that good stuff. Um, the other thing for sales, I would love for you to have a CRM tool that you're using some kind of CRM. I don't care what it is. Just use a CRM so that you can track sales data. Um, pictures, just use pictures of things to track stuff. Um, an event calendar, event setup forms, uh, weekly sales recaps from your team, um, an ERP system, please, an ERP system. So something like Ecos, Brew Ninja, Beer 30, something like that can help you track a ton of stuff on your scorecard systems. An email service provider that can help with metrics, uh, social media management software, like something like um, Hootsuite or Publer uh sprout social if you can afford it i love it it's expensive there's a couple that are awesome unless you're really into metrics just be careful with sprout it's awesome but it's expensive um spreadsheets accounting software quickbooks zero whatever um point of sale system like arrived um toast square something like that and then some kind of system of sops um, whether you have that just for production or you can actually write SOPs for other departments in your business. But again, that's a whole nother talk. So I won't go into that right now. Um, next, let's look at actually building out your scorecard. Um, the first thing that you need to do is look at your goals and then pick out. Oh, I have like software stuff here. OK, there. Um, anyways, you want to decide on your categories with your management or ownership team and just make sure that they correlate to your business goals directly. Um, share with everybody in the business, share them. Okay. And then decide as a team on your most important elements that you're okay with tracking. Sometimes what feels right to you might not feel right to the rest of the team. So that is a meeting and not an email. And that's something that I would get everybody's independent, um, takes on and then come together as a group and figure out your scorecards together. Um, next you want to create a spreadsheet, open up a Google sheet use some columns, put some things in there, put people's names on them, put some more columns for months or your tracking periods, whatever you want to do. Um, you can have a separate tab for each department. You could have a separate tab on your spreadsheet for each employee. However you want to do it, just kind of keep it in a centralized space so you're not chasing um, a million spreadsheets all the time, just as a good rule of thumb. Um, list the categories as rows. Um, I'm referencing my notes because I don't want to forget anything. Oh, let's talk about uh, timelines. So the one that I built for you as an example that has it by month. Um, I do like tracking things like month because I think when you have actual columns as weeks, it gets very overloading, it, it, like overwhelming, excuse me. Um, and it kind of turns into like an eye chart. Um, I like to update these things on a weekly basis but I don't actually finalize it until the end of the month. So that is something that you're going to have to like train people as like a new habit. And this is for everybody involved. And that is um, keeping an eye on it every week. Just honestly set a calendar reminder, just like get in Google calendar or outlook or what, you know, whatever you're using um, the Mac client uh, calendar, whatever it is, and just set like a little reminder or a little alert either on like Friday afternoon or Monday morning, whenever you have like an admin day or some, some day where you're doing a lot of planning, um, have a little bing bong go off. Like, hey, check the scorecard, right? It's not going to be finalized. That is a piece of it that goes into the forward facing element of this so that you can catch it in time and actually do something about it, right? Okay. Um, finally, decide who's going to do the tracking, delegate that, and then know how to the in interpret the results, which... I'm going to go over in just a second. So here is another example, just like drill it into your brains here. Um, and this is for a sales rep. And then this is for the marketing department. So this color coding system is something that I like to do. You can see that like I put uh, placeholder numbers in here as an example. Um, but the green and the red, it's like a pass fail thing, right? So like if we're on the right track, it's green, right? You're doing great. Um, if it's red, it's something that you need to pay attention to pretty easy, you know, green is go, red is stop. You need to take a look at this. You could use yellow if something's like right on the edge of being achieved. Um, but people would be able to just scroll through this and say, oh, 
you know, crap, I'm behind on my monthly POD goal. I got to step it up for the rest of the month or, oh no, I'm behind on the number of marketing emails that I sent out. Now that doesn't mean you need to send out like 10 marketing emails in the same week at the end of the month. If you're looking at your marketing scorecard, um, but you can reasonably assume that it's something that you either need to pay attention more to the rest of the month so you don't fall behind or carry that over to the following month and make up kind of for lost time, right? Okay, so how do we utilize these results and analyze this stuff? First of all, you've got to be proactive and track it in real time so that you can catch things that need to be worked on. So you got to stay on top of it um, as best as you can. Um, it also helps you stay aligned with your monthly goals, so you'll stay on pace. Um, this is really helpful for working with a distributor partner, so people that are selling in the wholesale channel. Um, if you're aligned with a distributor, um, this is a great way to kind of like hold each other accountable, and you should be checking in with your brand manager on a monthly basis, but these are the kind of things that you can communicate to them, not just saying like, hey, we're not selling very much beer this month. You can instead go in and say, hey, our PODs have kind of dropped off a little bit. We're about two selling weeks into the month. Um, you know, I'm going to talk to some of the reps about like trying to get some more placements. But, you know, just so you know, that's kind of fallen off the radar. We might need to give it some attention. If you can go as deep as like brand specific or package specific or premise, um, class of trade, stuff like that, then that's awesome. Um, it's a better way to communicate with your distributor partner. It is very specific. It allows them to know not only what you're working on, but kind of what they should be focusing on as well. So it's a two-way street there. It's very handy to have. Um, and it also helps keep your team on track. So sales managers out there, this is a great way to manage like a large sales team. Um, it can just kind of align like an overview of like how everybody's doing, right? Like where they're at, like a little bit of a status check. Maybe just maybe you can eliminate some meetings and just go with some informative emails, right? I, I know everybody out here wants to have more meetings, right? Yeah, I know. I don't want to have more meetings either. All right. This is a great way to practice data-led strategies. Here's the thing. That is a buzz term right now, data-led strategy. You not only need to have a data-led strategy to compete in today's modern marketplace, but you need to be data informed, right? So you can have data points that are leading your business strategies, but you also need to know how to interpret them. It is not enough to throw data into somebody's lap and expect them to know what to do with it. You need to know what those data points mean, what story it tells, and how you can react to it and leverage it in the market to grow your beverage business, all right? So for those uh, meetings that I was talking about, make this your meeting content. So instead of having a really boring sales meeting every morning uh, or every like Monday morning, you roll in with coffee, everybody's asleep. And like, how, th how are things going, guys? What are, you know, what's going on? Blah, 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 blah. You have a clear agenda for this meeting. We run through the scorecards. We see how we're doing. We run through like an issues list, what needs to be done, what's coming up. You can knock out a sales meeting in like 30, 45 minutes. Um, you can do the same thing with the different departments across the board in your organization. Um, and it's a way for you to give kudos to people, like small wins, right? Keeping up morale, keeping people motivated. Um, this also carries over to employee reviews. Um, scorecards are invaluable for employee reviews. Not only are they effective in measuring people's efforts um, and their activities and the results that are coming from those activities, but you're also able to celebrate the things that they are doing well, but also give them ideas on areas for improvement in a very clear and focused way without bias coming into the picture at all whatsoever. If you do have to put somebody on like a PIP or a performance improvement plan, this could be your basis for that without having any type of personal feelings coming into play for stuff because you've already outlined the roles and the responsibilities and if the effort is falling off or if the goals aren't being met, it's very cut and dry. It's a very cut and dry situation, right? Um, the other thing that's cool, finally, and I mentioned this earlier, is about advancement and bonuses or maybe promotions into different positions. Now, um, this is great to lay out like at the beginning of a calendar year. So if you're thinking about doing something like this, it might be great to implement um, for 2023. And that is just making it blatantly clear how you move up within your organization. 
by setting some benchmark goals, um, some benchmarks in the business that like, if this happens, then this happens. And that makes it very clear for everybody involved. Woo. Okay. That was a whirlwind, but thank you again. I'm going to stop sharing my slides here in a second so that I can see the StreamYard feed and see if there's any questions or anything that have popped up. But um, if you have any questions at all, uh, I'm a one woman show. So reach out to me. Everything goes straight to me. You can reach me at Julie at Not Your Hobby Marketing. Um, cruise over to my website. Um, I have a pretty funky, cool little email community. If you want to sign up for um, my email communications, it's called The Bottleneck, where we deal with issues with beverage businesses. You can find me on all the socials and all the things. Um, so please feel free to hit me up um, with questions over there. But I am going to officially stop sharing my screen and go back over here to the comment section and see what is going on. Uh, Amy, I mentioned uh, it's a book called Traction, you know, like track, like traction, like tire traction uh, by Gino Wickman. Um, and that is a absolute, or if you, you see anything else about the EOS system, that's his like proprietary stuff. So you can look for that. Um, oh, other people mentioned that. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for putting that in the chat as well. Um, people can see my email uh, or I'm sorry, my website address there. Uh, and if anyone else has any questions, are there any operational questions about like the setup or how to apply this or um, honestly, I think the one question that I get the most about this is how do we get buy-in from everybody in the company? Um, yes. Dana, yes, using Excel works and then share with Google Sheets if people don't have Excel. I actually don't. I'm a Mac girl and I function only on like Google documents. I do not have Microsoft things. <laughs> Sorry, Microsoft. Sorry, Steve Jobs. Um, but yeah, it works well because most people are comfortable with Google um, documents. I think um, usually when I answer the question about buy-in is that it really comes down to... Um, if people are financially motivated, um, like an unlimited earning potential, right? So like if you're functioning off of scorecard elements where it's not just a flat amount, like tied to compensation as like a bonus, but if it's a variable amount, so the more the company makes, the more I can make. So putting more effort into that will, you know, domino effect, right? The company's doing better. I'm making more money. Everybody's making money together. Um, but please don't feel limited by money motivations. Um, this is, ugh, this treads into HR territory, but um, find out what motivates people, what actually motivates your staff. For some people, it's not money. For some people, it might be like extra PTO, um, maybe help with like a gym membership, like some, you know, something like that, a gas card. I don't know. Um, but have it tied to that. So that could be a form of compensation as well. All right. I don't see any more questions. So I am going to sign off um, from South Carolina. Uh, next time you see me, I'll be back in Colorado. But um, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your conference. Thank you for being here with me. I greatly appreciate it. Again, thank you to Andrew. Thank you to Craft Beer Professionals and all the sponsors involved. Um, we really appreciate the education um, that you bring all of us here. So, and I'm definitely very grateful for being involved and having this community. Um, but everybody take care and have a good rest of your conference. Bye.